So yeah, Jeremiah chapter 26, and as we get into Jeremiah 26 here, we're going to be um, kind of moving into a whole nother uh, section, basically, in the book of um, Jeremiah. I'm not done yet, Christina, if you could just sit down. Um, I just started, uh, and already you have to leave. Okay, you go ahead. That's fine. All right, okay. That's fine. Don't hurt my feelings. No pressure. All right. I just want to set the precedent so nobody else is, a, everybody is afraid now to get up, right, tonight. They're just like, oh, I'm not moving. Okay. All right. In back row. Back row's not going to cut it. Get back up here. This is where you need to be. This is where you need to be, Christina. Okay. So, yeah, we're, we're getting into a, a whole new kind of section, another division, basically, in the book of Jeremiah, because the first 25 chapters have been primarily dealing with the the message that Jeremiah has given. What's kind of been the theme so far in the book of Jeremiah? What's been the, the bulk of the message that's been given? Anybody want to throw out a few ideas or suggestions or thoughts? Judgment. There you go. Judgment of God. That's basically it. The, if you could sum up the theme, basically, of the message so far in these first 25 chapters, it's really been focusing on the judgment of God uh, that's coming upon the people for their waywardness, their rebellion, their idolatry, just their disobedience of God and in their walk with God, right? They've been far from the Lord in, in their hearts and in their actions. And so judgment is coming. It's basically been a warning, right? It's been a, a word of the Lord to say, listen, turn around, guys, repent, get right with me so that you can be spared from this judgment that's coming. Well, now in chapter 26, 27, 28, 29, we're not going to get into all of that tonight. Um, but uh, quite a bit of it. But uh, in the next four chapters, 26 to 29, we're going to be focusing now really on the response, the reaction of the people to the message that's been given. Really the response now to the messenger as well, right? Uh, because Jeremiah is going to find himself in, in some difficult, precarious situations now because he's been a faithful man to God. He's been teaching the word. He's been sharing with the people what God's wanted him to share, but the people aren't liking it, right? They're not responding too well to it. And so we're going to see opposition really coming now against Jeremiah. We've already seen it, right? But we're seeing now, again, this opposition that's coming against Jeremiah. We're seeing that people do not want to hear <laughs> that they're walking in a wrong way, right? I mean, the minute that you begin to tell someone they're doing it wrong, you're going to find usually a real quick defensive response, right? People don't like to be told they're doing something wrong, right? Are you with me? I don't like it when somebody says, you're doing this wrong. I'm like, wait, what are you talking about? No, and I could know that I'm doing it wrong, but I'm like, I'm going to fight. I'm going to be like, what are you talking about? No, I'm not doing this wrong. I think you're wrong, you know? We don't want to be told we're wrong, all right? It takes a little bit of, you know, just kind of a breaking of our own will in a sense to admit that we're wrong and to walk in humility. Well, the people aren't here yet. You know, they don't want to hear that they're walking in any error and any wrongness. So they're kind of coming and, and responding to Jeremiah in a harsh way. And, and interestingly, Jeremiah is going to, we're going to see in chapter 26 here, he's going to be having to do it on some interesting territory. He's going to be at the temple doing it, right? And so if opposition's coming, why would God have Jeremiah go and share this kind of a word? Why would God put Jeremiah in that situation? We might ask that of ourselves. God, why would you ever put us in a dangerous situation? Well, first of all, we know that the truth needs to get out, right? Truth needs to get out. And so God is putting Jeremiah in that place to, to speak the truth and to invest in people's lives. Secondly, we know um, that, that in this time of opposition... It's an opportunity for Jeremiah to draw closer to the Lord. You see, when things are going well, right, we oftentimes kind of feel like, oh, it's okay, I've got this covered, God. I don't really need you. But in this time of opposition, it's going to teach Jeremiah that he really needs to lean on the Lord, right? That the Lord is going to be his shelter, his help, his refuge. And God told him that in the very beginning, in chapter 1, that God was going to send him out, but he will be that, he'll make Jeremiah like that fortified city. That's going to come through the help of the Lord. Second, uh, thirdly, we know that we're not always guaranteed smooth sailing, right? Uh, we tend to think that sometimes, that now that we're a child of God, now that we're serving the Lord, oh, everything's going to be smooth sailing from here on in. Everything's just going to be clear skies, open, calm waters. It's going to be great, right? But you see, if we are just remaining in smooth waters, we're not going to be conditioned for the rougher waters that we sometimes need to venture through to get us to where God wants us to be, right? 
God had something great in store for Jeremiah. God had a specific plan in mind for Jeremiah. God was going to be faithful to lead Jeremiah through. All he needed Jeremiah was to be faithful himself. And God was going to take him through. But it'd be through stormy seas and everything like that that's going to condition Jeremiah to be stronger and to continue on when opposition continues to mount. And so there's lessons to be learned in and through all of these things that Jeremiah is going to be facing. There's lessons for us to be learned when we go through these kinds of situations. Well, look at chapter 26, verse 1. Let's get into it here. It says, In the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came from the Lord, saying, Thus says the Lord, Stand in the court of the Lord's house and speak to all the cities of Judah, which come to worship in the Lord's house. All the words that I command you to speak to them do not diminish a word. Perhaps everyone will listen and turn from his evil way that I may relent concerning the calamity which I purpose to bring on them because of the evil of their doings. So here's Jeremiah, and he's giving a specific dating now again. First, as we've seen in some of the previous chapters here, it's in the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, which is giving us now the date of about 609 BC. Uh, it, it's probably looking at, you know, kind of the, the beginning of his reign to, you know, sort of that uh, ascension to the throne time and, and everything. So it, it's somewhere within that first year of his reign. So some date it 609 to 608 BC. It doesn't really matter. It gives us a bit of a framework and, and uh, an idea of when this is happening here in our, in our context, in our story here. So it's the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim. And it's also kind of a um, precarious situation right now also because, again, we know that um, things with Babylon are, are beginning to heat up in a sense, you know, and things are getting tense, you know, for the people. And it's now in this time that Jeremiah is called to go to the house of the Lord. It says, stand in the court of the Lord's house and speak to all the cities of Judah. So most likely this is kind of a festival time. It's a feast day perhaps when people are coming from all around. All the cities of Judah are gathering together. And here's God raising up Jeremiah now to come into this very crowded public place now in the temple. And it's a time when people are coming to do their religious activities in a sense, right? They're thinking everything's good. We're coming to the temple. We have our temple. We're doing our religious duty. And everybody's thinking, what are you saying that we're doing something wrong? Look at what we're doing. We're coming to worship God. How dare you say, Jeremiah, that we are not right with God? And it's in that scene and in that situation that Jeremiah has to come and preach this word, right? You know? And, and again, this is not one that's going to be received too well. But again, the problem was that the people were coming with a religious observance outwardly. They were wanting to put on a show of religiosity by coming into the temple and doing all these religious ordinances. But their heart was far from God. God was much more concerned with what was going on the inside than what was happening on the outside. And that was the problem with the people in Jeremiah's day. And notice... Jeremiah can't, you know, take the foot off the pedal here. He can't sit there and say, well, God, you know, can I just take it easy with these guys? They're, they're trying. I mean, they're in the temple. They're sort of trying to do the right thing. No, God says, do not diminish a word, he says at the end of verse 2. Do not diminish a word. Do not hold back. Do not take away any little bit of the word that I want to share with the people here. So Jeremiah was to be foot to the pedal and just give it. That means everything the Lord is saying, Right? Um, every little bit of truth. We can think sometimes that, you know, we're being truthful. We're sharing things that are kind of accurate. But if we're not giving the whole picture, right, and we're withholding something, then we're, in a sense, withholding the truth. And we know that a half truth is a whole lie, right? It's like, you know, let's say I was going to meet my wife somewhere. Or I, I told her, I'm going to be home at this time for dinner. And I'm totally late. And she's kind of upset. I had this meal prepared. What's going on? You know, you're late. I said, I'm sorry I was late, honey. I was doing some official police business, right? In reality, I was pulled over for speeding. I'm getting a speeding ticket, right? Now, it can be true. I was, I was involved in some official police business there, dear. But in reality, I'm just in trouble because I was speeding. And now it's like, oh, man, even worse, right? Not only am I late, but I got a ticket and everything. It's not good. Not a true story, didn't happen, not a true story, but just in case, you're wondering. But you see, we're called as people of God to be those that are sharing all of God's word, 
all of the truth, not holding back. We can sometimes want to sugarcoat things a little bit, right? It's like, you know, on Sunday in Revelation, how John was to take the word and digest it, take it in. And he said, it would be sweet in your mouth, but it will be bitter in your belly. Why was it going to be bitter? Because the word involves things that pertain to judgment, pertains to sin, pertains to our own, you know, wickedness and falling away from the Lord and how we need a savior. That to some people can be very bitter because it, it, it shows them that they're not right in themselves and they can't do anything in and of themselves to save themselves. But too often, even from pulpits uh, across churches, you know, we just want to give the good parts. We just want to give the sweet parts, right? Oh, yeah, God loves you, and God's got a great plan for you, and, you know, he's just going to do great things in your life. And we leave out all the other parts that says, man, we need to walk in repentance. We need to deal with sin. We want to we be those that are walking in holiness before the Lord. We leave out some of those parts, you know, and the, and the consequences that might come for our disobedience. We want to leave those things out. We want to just give the sweet stuff, right? You know? But if all we're digesting is just sweet stuff, what's going to happen? We're going to get tooth decay. And what's happening in churches, there's some truth decay going on because they're not getting all the truth, right? They're missing out on some things. But you see, when you begin to paint the whole picture, not only do we hear that, okay, we're sinners, yeah, and, and we're not right with God, but we begin to see that there is some great truth in that, that God does love you, and he sent his son to die on the cross for you to save you, to take the judgment of God in your place, to do the work that you couldn't do yourself. Jesus came to do that. You see, man, there's good news that comes, but oftentimes people need to hear the, the full picture for them to realize why they need the good news. So Jeremiah is told, do not diminish a word, do not hold back. No matter how upset people might be, no matter how much people don't want to hear it, don't diminish the word, don't hold back. And the reason why is, again, God's heart here. Perhaps everyone will listen and turn from his evil way, that I may relent concerning the calamity which I purpose to bring on them because of the evil of their doing. So God's desire was to turn back from judgment coming. He didn't want it. This was not something God's looking forward to. He's not just, you know, waiting for that, that clock to hit midnight and go, all right, now it's my time. He's wanting to hold back. But because he's a good and just God, judgment needs to come for sin, for wickedness. That needs to be judged. But if the people would repent and return to him, he would be able to spare them a judgment and to hold back. And he says in verse 4, you shall say to them, thus says the Lord, if you will not listen to me to walk in my law, which I have set before you, to heed the words of my servants, the prophets whom I sent to you, both rising up early and sending them, but you have not heeded, then I'll make this house like Shiloh, and will make this city a curse to all the nations of the earth. So the priests and the prophets and all the people heard Jeremiah speaking these words in the house of the Lord. Let me just stop right there. And so we see that there were many prophets that had come. And speaking these same things, you know. And, and the Lord is saying, if, if you would just listen to them, you know, to walk in, in my law, which I said before you. But they would not. They chose not to listen. They didn't listen to the, the words of all of his servants, the prophets, whom he had sent out faithfully. And here's the great thing is that God was faithful to make sure that that word got out. To paint the, to show and shine light on the path that they were to take, right? God was faithful. He sent servant after servant, prophet after prophet, to say, this is the way that you need to walk, and this is the way that leads to life. But they were not willing. So it says, I'll, I'll make this house like shallow, and I'll make this city a curse to all the nations of the earth. Now, this is a message that is very similar to what we read of in Jeremiah chapter 7. That Jeremiah chapter 7 is called the Temple Sermon. And many believe that this chapter here is really kind of a summary of that chapter, we're seeing many of the same things being said that Jeremiah said back in chapter 7 there. And yet, in that chapter, it's focusing again on the message that was given. Here, we're really focusing on the response to that message. But here now, the Lord is coming and saying, if you're not going to listen to this word, I'm going to make this place, this very temple, like that of Shiloh, all right? And that was a, a serious thing. The people thought, oh man, we've got our temple 
This is God's house. This is where God shows himself to us. Nothing can happen to us. Come on. This is kind of like our, our safe zone, our safe house. Nothing's going to befall us because we got the temple here. God's not going to allow anything to happen to the city because that would mean then the destruction of the temple. Surely that's not going to happen. But God says, well, remember Shiloh. See, some 400 years ago, Shiloh was the place where the tabernacle sat. The Ark of the Covenant was there, the place where God's glory dwelt. And there they had this place, the tabernacle, the Ark in Shiloh, and yet they were not exempt from destruction coming upon that place. They could go up to Shiloh in this day and realize that, man, Shiloh's been ransacked, taken down, destroyed. Because they themselves back then fell to idolatry again. They walked in disobedience to God, and they paid the price for it. Even though they had the ark sitting there, it was taken away from them because of their disobedience. So though they're thinking the same argument now, going, oh, nothing's going to happen to us here. we got the temple. God says, remember what happened to Shiloh? Oh, yeah, that was, that was some 400 years ago. But remember, I did it once, and I'll, I'll do it again. See, God's more concerned, again, with them and, and the temple of God that they are rather than the very structure of the temple. God's more concerned about their heart than just them following in some religious observance. So God's saying, I will make this place and this city a curse to all the nations. Notice that. Make this city a curse to all the nations. That's a real switcheroony from what he says in Genesis 12, 3, right? Where he says, you will be a blessing to all the nations of the earth. And now they're being called told you'll be a curse to all the nations of the earth. That's not what God intended. But their sin is leading them down this path of, of terror, of destruction. So verse 7, the priests and the prophets and all the people heard Jeremiah speaking these words in the house of the Lord. Now it happened when Jeremiah had made an end of speaking all that the Lord had commanded him to speak to all the people that the priests and the prophets and all the people seized him saying, you will surely die. Why have you prophesied in the name of the Lord saying this house shall be like Shiloh when the city shall be desolate without an, inhab an, an inhabitant? And all the people were gathered against Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. When the princes of Judah heard these things, they came up from the king's house to the house of the Lord and sat down in the entry of the new gate of the Lord's house, and the priests and the prophets spoke to the princes and all the people, saying, This man deserves to die, for he has prophesied against this city, as you have heard with your ears. So here now, we see various princes in verse 10 of Judah coming, these officials now coming, perhaps these men sent uh, uh, you know, by the king. And they're coming now, and they sit in the, in the gate, which is where they conducted all these different, you know, business and legal matters. And so there's basically a, a bit of a court case going on now before Jeremiah. And the, the priests and the, and the false prophets are coming and giving this word saying that Jeremiah deserves to die. Because basically, Jeremiah preaching this word, not diminishing a word, but saying this place is going to be taken down. To them, that was like treason, all right? There's kind of like a, a law set up even in their minds that to speak against the temple and against the city was not only like treason, but it was blasphemous. And so they're looking at what Jeremiah is saying and saying, this guy is no prophet of God. Nobody would speak against the temple and say it'd be ruined and be a messenger of God, yet Jesus said the same thing, right? That shocked a lot of people that not one stone will be left here upon another in the temple. And so they think, man, Jeremiah, you're, you're way out there, you're you've now gone over the edge. You committed treason, blasphemy. You deserve to die. And in their minds, they really believe that he deserved to die. But these officials come in now, and they're in the gate, and they're conducting this, this civil court matter now. And notice Jeremiah, in verse 12, spoke to all the princes and all the people, saying, the Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and against this city with all the words that you've heard, now, therefore, amend your ways and your doings and obey the voice of the Lord your God, then the Lord will relent concerning the doom that he has pronounced against you. As for me, here I am in your hand. Do with me as seems good and, and proper to you, but know for certain that if you put me to death, you will surely bring innocent blood on yourselves, on this city, and on its inhabitants. For truly the Lord has sent me to you to speak all these words in your hearing. So Jeremiah is given an opportunity now to basically defend himself, to give a bit of a case for himself. And he does it in a threefold way. 
He says, first of all, there in verse 12, listen, the Lord has sent me, all right? I have been commissioned by the Lord. I've been sent by the Lord. I am here speaking the words of the Lord. And if you knew the word of the Lord, <laughs> you would know that what I'm saying lines up with it, that I'm not speaking any air. That's the problem, right? God had already stated all these things back in, in Deuteronomy uh, of the blessings that would come for the obedience to the word, but the cursings that would come. Jeremiah is not speaking anything out of tune or out of line with God's word. If they knew the word of God, they would know that this was God's word that Jeremiah was speaking. So he says, I've been sent by the Lord. I'm coming as, as you know, a messenger, a prophet, a true prophet of the Lord. That's his first case. I'm sent to the Lord. Secondly, he says, listen, there's, there's some conditions here. One condition is that if you will turn from all this, this can be held back. You have the opportunity, Jeremiah is saying, to hold back or to see God's judgment cease if you will amend your ways now, okay? If you will turn and repent from your doings and turn back to the Lord. Then he says, the Lord will relent concerning the doom that is pronounced against you. So Jeremiah says, hey, here's the deal. I'm not saying anything that is, you know, meant just to hurt you, I'm speaking a truth for your good that you can be spared, all right? I'm sent by the Lord, first of all. Secondly, there's conditions in place that if you will repent, this doom that's coming your way will cease, it will stop. And thirdly now, in Jeremiah's defense, he says, if you take my life, man, you're just gonna heap up more guilt on yourself because you're gonna be shedding innocent blood and that blood is gonna be on your hands. That's what Jeremiah is saying there in verse 14 and 15. I like how he responds in verse 14. Ask for me, here I am in your hand. Do with me as seems good and proper to you. Isn't that a man who's kind of like just faithful under fire, right? That's Jeremiah, isn't it? Faithful under fire. And I think he truly knows that he is not in their hands, but he's in the Lord's hands. And he's confident and he's secure in that. Understand, guys, that whatever situation you find yourself in, no matter what threat maybe even is coming against you, that you constantly, as you abide in the Lord, are in his hands. And as much as Jeremiah would say, here I am, I am in your hands. Jeremiah knew the truth that he was ultimately in the Lord's hands. And though somebody might come and try to take your life, rest assured and be secure in the fact that nothing can befall you apart from the Lord's timing in your life. I think it was George Whitefield um, that said, we are immortal until the Lord's work on earth is done for us. Don't you love that? We are immortal until our work for the Lord on earth is done. I'm paraphrasing that, but that's the idea. Nothing can take your life until the Lord says, okay, now I'm done with you. Now you've completed the work I have for you. I think Jeremiah's that place says, here I am in your hands, do with me as seems good to you. But Jeremiah ultimately knew, you guys can't do nothing against me until the Lord gives the green light for it. Until the Lord says, all right, Jeremiah, your time is up. Your work is complete. Come on home. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Guys, that's the kind of security and trust me to live in and with, to know that nothing can befall you apart from what God has for you. So Jeremiah says, listen, you guys can do with me what you want, but you're just going to be adding more guilt on yourselves, and you're already kind of painted yourself in a corner. You're already on some shaky ground right now. I would not go there if I were you. Think this through, guys. This is sort of what Jeremiah is saying to them. So notice verse 16. So the princes and all the people said to the priests and the prophets, this man does not deserve to die, for he has spoken to us in the name of of the Lord our God. Then certain of the elders of the land rose up and spoke to all the assembly of the people, saying, let me stop right there. Do you see how quick the Lord's came, come through for him, right? Here's Jeremiah saying, hey, do with me as seems good to you. But now all of a sudden, here's princes and, and people coming and saying, hey, guys, you're foolish. You're wrong. This guy's done nothing that deserves death. God's already raising up people to, to spare Jeremiah. And there might be times where you might feel isolated all alone in the Lord's work. Nevertheless, know that God has people sitting in the wings ready to help, ready to defend. And this is what's happening in Jeremiah's life. 
So certain of the elders of the land rose up and spoke to all the assembly of the people, saying in verse 18, Micah of Morsheth prophesied in the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah, and spoke to all the people of Judah, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Zion shall be plowed like a field, Jerusalem shall become heaps of ruins, and the mountains of the temple like the bare hills of the forest. So here they're, they're quoting right from Micah chapter 3, verse 12, basically saying, Micah said the same thing about Zion and even about the temple, you know, that it's going to be plowed like a field. Micah prophesied against the city. The very thing that they're accusing Jeremiah of treason and blasphemy, said Micah, another prophet, said the same thing. And you know what? In that day, Hezekiah repented of it, and they were spared. They were spared. God was able to hold back. Notice verse 19. Did Hezekiah, king of Judah, and all Judah ever put him to death? Did he not fear the Lord and seek the Lord's favor? And the Lord relented concerning the doom which he had pronounced against them. But we are doing great evil against ourselves. So they're bringing up a case from their history to say, listen, guys, we should learn from our past. We should learn from our past to realize that the same thing was said, and yet they responded a lot differently than what you guys are responding to. They relented and the Lord, or sorry, they repented and the Lord relented and held back. Now, in verse 20, they give another illustration. Jeremiah, perhaps, uses this one. And it seems at first like this is kind of out of place, why we would hear about this. But let's just read that and see here. Verse 20, now, there was also a man who prophesied in the name of the Lord Uriah, the son of Shemaiah of Kiriath-Jerim, who prophesied against the city and against this land, according to all the words of Jeremiah. And when Jehoiakim, the king, with all his mighty men and all the princes, heard his words, the king sought to put him to death. But when Uriah heard it, he was afraid and fled and went to Egypt. And then Jehoiakim, the king, sent men to Egypt, Elnathan, the son of Akbor, and other men who went with him to Egypt. And they brought Uriah from Egypt and brought him to Jehoiakim, the king, who killed him with the sword, cast his dead body into the graves of the common people. So Jeremiah brings up this other prophet, and again, another prophet that's only mentioned here in Jeremiah, but he was a prophet that was sharing the truth and the word of God, but why Jeremiah brings this up, we're not exactly sure, because it wasn't a happy ending for Uriah. Now, some might say Jeremiah brings up to show that Jehoiakim here was a man who was very ruthless and just set on killing, you know, innocent people, basically, Jehoiakim had, uh, you know, men sent to Egypt to bring him back and had Uriah killed. That Jehoiakim was quick to kill other prophets that were speaking the word of the Lord. Some believe maybe Jeremiah puts this in here to show that he was a man that was going to stay the course and preach the word regardless of what came. You see? That he was going to stand on solid ground In the Lord and not be quick to run, you see. Uriah was quick to run. Here's Jeremiah, faithful under fire, but Uriah is fleeting and fearful, you know. He's running away, and he paid a steep price for it, you see. He didn't remain faithful under fire. He didn't remain, you know, just sheltered in the Lord and allowing the Lord to help him and and, and deal with him here. So we're not sure exactly, you know, why that's brought up, but it's brought up as a, as a case in point, as a lesson there, that Jeremiah didn't need, uh, feel the need to run, because he was secure in what he was sharing, and he was secure in the Lord. Nevertheless, the hand of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, was with Jeremiah, so that they should not give him into the hand of the people to put him to death. Now, Ahikam was um, one of the... Oh, let me see here. Let me see who Ahikam was. I can't remember, but I got it written down here somewhere. Um, Ahikam, along with his father, was a man that served as a scribe under Josiah when the book of the law was found there in the temple. Uh, it's talked about in 2 Kings 22, verse 8 to 14. And so here's another man, Ahikam, that is coming alongside to assist and to help Jeremiah. Again, the Lord just having people in place to come and Bring that help when Jeremiah needs it. Jeremiah may have thought, I'm all alone, I'm isolated, nobody's, you know, I'm just a lone ranger here, yet God is showing that he's got people ready to step in and help, you know, 
Just like Paul many times when he felt like he was all alone and yet God would say that he's got many people in this city to, to you know, serve him and to be a help and to be a resource there. Now, chapter 27. Interesting beginning here because it says, In the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Pretty much exactly the same way that chapter 26 begins. And yet, we're going to see that this chapter really centers around Zedekiah, the king. Verse 3 mentions Zedekiah, uh, as well as verse 12. And, and the whole context of the chapter is really revolving around the time of King Zedekiah. Now, um, this is kind of interesting um, because many believe that Zedekiah should be the king that's mentioned in verse 1, and yet Jehoiakim is mentioned. Um, the thought, the idea is that as a scribe was copying the text here, you know, he kind of got a little bit confused, perhaps looked at chapter 26 and just kind of copied what chapter 26 said, rather than copying what chapter 27 would have said, which was most likely talking about the time of King Zedekiah. So many believe this is to be a, a copyist error. Nevertheless, it doesn't change anything really regarding what the word of the Lord is saying and, and the flow of the chapter because, again, the flow of the chapter is all centered around Zedekiah. And, in fact, in um, the Septuagint, I believe it is, it omits verse 1 entirely. So they seem to realize that verse 1 probably was a copyist error, and so the Septuagint doesn't have verse 1 in there. Now, it says in verse 2, thus says the Lord to me, make for yourselves bonds and yokes and put them on your neck and send them to the king of Eden, the king of Moab, the king of the Ammonites, the king of Tyre, and the king of Sidon by the hand of the messengers who come to Jerusalem to Zedekiah, king of Judah. So this chapter, again, deals with, with King Zedekiah. And let me give you a bit of context here now. In 605 BC, Nebuchadnezzar subdued the former Egyptian territories from um, the brook of Egypt to the river Euphrates. In 597 BC now, he subdued Jerusalem by laying siege to the city. And King Jehoiachin surrendered. And King Nebuchadnezzar took many temple treasures and the scientists and technicians, all the highly valued citizens basically took them back to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar then installed Zedekiah as a puppet ruler basically. All right? So that's what's happened. So again... It's kind of very uh, a volatile situation right now. Things are, are tense. Things are on shaky ground here. And Jeremiah now is called to give another one of his illustrated sermons, another action message in a sense, right? So he's told to make a yoke, basically, and put them around your neck. That's what Jeremiah is to do. Take a yoke, put it around your neck. Now, a yoke was typically made up of a, a board of wood that would go, you know, like typically on an oxen, right, that you would use for plowing in the field. A board of wood on the front of his neck, another board on the back of the neck, and then straps that would tie those together. The, the NIV translates that verse saying, make a yoke out of straps and crossbars and put it on as a yoke. That's kind of a, um, or put it on your neck, sorry. That's kind of a, a better way to look at it, a good translation there. Make a yoke out of straps and crossbars and put it on your neck. So that's what Jeremiah's called to do. And he's also called to really make five more and give them to these um, men, these delegates from these various kings and nations all around Israel. So why was Jeremiah to make a yoke and put it on? Well, let's read on and see um, what the relevance is of that. It says in verse 4, And command them to say to their masters, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Thus you shall say to your masters, I have made the earth, the man, and the beasts that are on the ground by my great power and by my outstretched arm, and have given it to whom it seemed proper to me. And now I have given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and the beasts of the field I have also given him to serve him. So all nations shall serve him and his son and his son's son until the time of his land comes, and then many nations and great kings shall make him serve them, and it shall be that the nation and kingdom which will not serve Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and which will not put its neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon, that nation I will punish, says the Lord, with the sword, the famine, and the pestilence, until I've consumed them 
by his hand. Interesting. So these five men, these delegates from these various nations are coming into Jerusalem, into Judah. And, and I think essentially they're looking to really, again, secure this, this um, confederacy, this ally of nations so that they can, you know, really use their strength together to combat the Babylonians who are, again, this, this world power now. They're, again, they've already taken some people away. They've already shown their strength and their power. And these nations are shaking in their boots. And so they're looking to come together now and say, let's form an alliance and let's go against these guys together. And yet the word of the Lord comes to them and says, and, and, and he's telling Jeremiah, make these yokes now. Give them to those guys. Bring them back to their kings and say, you guys are to put this on. Basically what he's saying is, you're to serve King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, that would seem like a pretty strange word because nobody's going to look at that and go, yeah, that seems like a good thing to do. That seems like a real profitable thing to do. Let's yield ourselves to the king of Babylon. Everybody's going to look at that and go, no way, that's not going to end well. That's not going to be a good thing. We've got to fight. We're going to go down fighting. If it means we're going to die, I'd rather die fighting than just surrender to the king. And yet, what do we see here, guys? Look at what the Lord says in, in verse 5. I have made the earth, the man, and the beast that are on the ground by my great power and by my outstretched arm, and have given it to whom it seemed proper to me. God's saying, I have formed all, I have made all, and I'm the one that's essentially in control of all. He's saying this to these people that are coming. He's saying it to Jeremiah to speak to these people because they're all thinking we can do something about this. And God's saying, I'm the one that's in control of all this here. You can't do anything outside of what I am desiring to do. And I am the one that has raised up Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, to be my servant right now to carry out my work. This is what God is saying to them. I have chosen Nebuchadnezzar now to be my servant. And you need to come now and surrender to him. Notice he says in verse 8, um, And it shall be that the nation and kingdom which will not serve Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and which will not put its neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon, that nation I will punish, says the Lord. I'm going to punish them. They're going to, they're going to suffer for it. Remember, God had already told Jeremiah to tell the people of Judah, submit to the king of, Nebuchadnezzar, of Babylon. Submit and let yourself be taken away, and it will be well with you. If you remain, you will die. God had already told them that he's going to bring them back into the land. He's going to spare them. He's going to take them away to Babylon. But he's going to essentially protect them there and bring them back. He's telling these people, submit, and it will go well with you. It flies in the face of what seems like the right thing to do, doesn't it? It shows us that we can't rely upon human wisdom or upon even common sense in what is always the right thing or the godly thing to do. So often we just kind of look at a situation and go, well, uh, it would seem to me the right thing to do would be to do this. And yet God so often goes way outside of human wisdom and common sense. Because if he just works according to that, then we don't really need God. God does things that seem very strange so that he can do the work and we realize that was so outside of ourselves. That was so the Lord that did that. And it's the same situation here. God's going to do something so contrary to what people might think is the right thing to do. But so as to show that he is the one that's really in control and leading all these things. So, let's read on verse 9. Therefore, do not listen to your prophets, your diviners, your dreamers, your soothsayers, or your sorcerers who speak to you saying, you shall not serve the king of Babylon. For they prophesy a lie to you to remove you far from your land, and I will drive you out and you will perish. But the nations that bring their necks under the yoke of the king of Babylon and serve him, I will let them remain in their own land, says the Lord, and they shall till it and dwell in it. So they weren't to listen to all their, their soothsayers, their diviners, all the ones that were saying, hey, no way, man, don't follow the king. Fight, you gotta fight. Saying, don't listen to them. They're liars. They don't, they're not speaking on behalf of the Lord. Don't listen to them. He says, if you serve the king, if you submit, you're going to remain in your own land. You're going you're to have good pasture. You're going to be in a good situation. Submit. 
And you see, here's the thing, guys. To submit to Nebuchadnezzar was to submit to God. This is the word of the Lord. To rebel against Nebuchadnezzar was to rebel against God. And so, serve them, submit. Put their necks under the yoke of the king of Babylon, and they're going to remain in their own land. That's what the word of the Lord is saying. So Jeremiah says the same thing now, basically, to Zedekiah. He comes back to his own king now. He's spoken to the kings of the surrounding nations. Now he's saying, let me speak to my own king now, as God leads him. And he says, in verse 12, I also spoke to Zedekiah, king of Judah, according to all these words, saying, bring your necks under the yoke of the king of Babylon, and serve him and his people, and live. Why will you die, you and your people, by the sword, by the famine, and by the pestilence, as the Lord has spoken against the nation that will not serve the king of Babylon? Therefore, do not listen to the words of the prophets who speak to you, saying, You shall not serve the king of Babylon, for they prophesy a lie to you. For I have not sent them, says the Lord. Yet they prophesy a lie in my name, that I may drive you out, and that you may perish, you and the prophets who prophesy to you. Again, we talked about that a few chapters ago, right? Just because a person comes along and says, thus saith the Lord, we need to weigh that with the very word of the Lord. Because what the prophets are saying, very clearly is laid out here, is just as a lie. They're prophesying a lie to you. And we need to be discerning. We don't just receive somebody that says, thus saith the Lord. We take that, tuck in your back pocket and say, I'm going to see what the Lord does with that now. I'm going to see how that, that weighs out with the word of the Lord and how God himself will confirm that with me. But you don't just take a word from someone and run with it just because they attach, thus saith the Lord, to it. Because there were many prophets in Jeremiah's day that were saying, oh, no, no, no. No, we're not, we're not going to be doomed here. No, no, no. Fight the king of Babylon. We're not going to be carried away. It'll go well with us if we stay and fight. This is what they were saying. But the Lord says, why will you die <laughs> by following these lies? Well, verse 16 also, I spoke to the priests and to all this people, saying, Thus says the Lord, do not listen to the words of your prophets who prophesied to you, saying, Behold, the vessels of the Lord's house will now shortly be brought back from Babylon, for they prophesy a lie to you. Do not listen to them. Serve the king of Babylon and live. Why should this city be laid waste? But if they are prophets and if the word of the Lord is with them, let them now make intercession to the Lord of hosts that the vessels which are left in the house of the Lord, in the house of the king of Judah, and at Jerusalem, do not go to Babylon. For thus says the Lord of hosts, concerning the pillars, concerning the sea, concerning the carts, and concerning the remainder of the vessels that remain in the city, which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, did not take, when he carried away captive Jeconia, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, from Jerusalem to Babylon, and all the nobles of Judah and Jerusalem. Yes, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, concerning the vessels that remain in the house of the Lord, and in the house of the king of Judah and of Jerusalem. They shall be carried to Babylon, and there they shall be until the day that I visit them, says the Lord. Then I will bring them up and restore them to this place. So Jeremiah spoke to the kings in the surrounding nations. He spoke to Zedekiah, same word. And now basically gives an, a, a word to the priests now, okay, in verse 16, to the priests. And again, don't listen to the words of your prophets. They're prophesying falsehoods. And lies to you. And they were saying, hey, listen, the vessels of the Lord's house, oh, they're shortly going to be brought back from Babylon. Oh, they're coming. And they also say, and even our king, um, Jeconia, uh, he's going to be returned again to us. Um, I think that's who it is that was mentioned there. Um, yeah, carried a cow Jeconia, the son of Jehoiakim. You see, what was happening here, again, there were three deportations that the Babylonians made, okay? They came in in 605 B.C., also in 597, and then in, in 586 B.C. Uh, they came in and, and took parts of the temple and different furnishings. That's what's being talked of, of the vessels of the temple. And so, again, they're talking about these vessels that are going to return shortly. That would have been speaking about the, the first deportation in 605 when, again, Jeconia was taken away. And what's happening now this time is there was a bit of a, a revolt, a bit of an uprising going on in Babylon. Historians tell us that there was a bit of a, you know, conspiracy going on there in Babylon. And, and Nebuchadnezzar was kind of fighting through this. And so the people and the priests and the false prophets especially thought, this is it now. You know, the kingdom of the Babylonians is crumbling. It's, gonna, it's just going to fall apart. And, and, and we're going to be able to have all these things returned back to us now. 
just a short time, it's all going to be back. And they're saying here, you know, oh, all these things are going to be brought back to us in just a, a short time. So what is Jeremiah saying? Oh, well, you know what? Go ahead and, and intercede now. Go ahead and pray about those things. See if it's, if it's going to happen. Verse 18, uh, let them now make intercession to the Lord, that the vessels which are left in the house of the Lord, in the house of the king of Judah, do not go to Babylon. See, he's saying, you know, let's see now, not only if the vessels that are taken away will come back, but if the ones that are in the temple will even remain where they are. You see? Go ahead and pray. See what the Lord does. Because if they pray and they see these things come to, to pass, then it's going to show that, oh, the Lord's answering their prayer. Maybe the Lord is really on their side. But the fact is that the Babylonians are going to come in again very shortly and take another group of people away and take more of the temple treasures and vessels and furnishings away and take it away. And, it's gonna, and the Lord says it's going to remain there now for a period of time until I come and visit them again. Visit his people in Babylon and lead them back and visit the Babylonians for their judgment now, you see. So Jeremiah's giving this challenge here. But again, these people were more concerned about, you know, the temple treasures than they were about their own lives and about their own obedience to the Lord here. Well, chapter 28, a short chapter. We're going to just fly through this one here tonight, okay? Um, I want to just get into this one here. But again, um, th these were people here now that, that should have been more concerned with the people that had gone and saving people, saving them own, their own selves in the city than they were about trying to save things to do with the temple. Again, they were making things all about uh, a religious sort of duty and a religious fervor than they were about truly having a heart for people and even a heart for themselves to say, we just want to be right with the Lord. We want to be walking holiness. They were more concerned about the holy vessels than they were themselves being a holy vessel for the Lord, you see. That was the problem. That's what got them into this trouble in the first place, that they had strayed from the Lord, you see. Well, now in chapter 28, we get into a bit of a, a duel here now, okay? <laughs> A duel means a war of two, and that's what we have in chapter 20, a duel between two prophets, all right? First one is our man, Jeremiah. Second one is the villain, um, Hananiah. Look at chapter 20, verse 1. And it happened in the same year, at the beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, king of Judah. And again, that's where, again, we, we get the idea that the whole context, chapter 27 and 28, is dealing with the time frame of Zedekiah. So it happened again. In the same year, beginning of the reign of Zedekiah, in the fourth year and in the fifth month that Hananiah, the son of Azur, the prophet, who was from Gibeon, spoke to me in the house of the Lord in the presence of the priests and of all the people, saying, Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, saying, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. Within two full years I will bring back to this place all the vessels of the Lord's house that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, took away from this place and carried to Babylon. And I will bring back to this place Jeconia, the son of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, with all the captives of Judah who went to Babylon, says the Lord, for I will break the yoke of the king of Babylon. So here's Hananiah now. He steps into the scene and, and again kind of looks to duel, to combat Jeremiah there in the house of the Lord, even. And he, you know, is looking to challenge this word that Jeremiah has given, the word about the yoke that he was to put on, that the people were to put on, to bring themselves, in a sense, a picture, bring themselves into submission to the king of Babylon. Well, now, Hananiah says, oh, now, wait a second. Here's the word of the Lord. We've broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. He no longer is going to have any control, any power. It's been broken, the yoke there, and now we're going to see these vessels return. Within two years, basically, they're saying, within two years, we're going to see the people that were taken, including Jeconia, our king, and we're going to see them and the vessels of the temple brought back. Now it's going to be good. And so here's the word that he's coming now uh, again with this challenge there to Jeremiah. And so the prophet Jeremiah in verse 5 spoke to the prophet Hananiah in the presence of the priests and in the presence of all the people who stood in the house of the Lord. And the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. The Lord do so. The Lord perform your words which you have prophesied to bring back the vessels of the Lord's house and all who were carried away captive from Babylon to this place. Nevertheless, 
Hear now this word that I speak in your hearing and in the hearing of all the people. The prophets who have been before me and before you of old prophesied against many countries and great kingdoms of war and disaster and pestilence. As for the prophet who prophesies of peace, when the word of the prophet comes to pass, the prophet will be known as one whom the Lord has truly sent. So here Jeremiah says, verse 6, amen. Now is he responding that way because he is uh, basically saying, yeah, I agree, Hananiah. Good word. Well done. Well said. Amen. I, I preach it. I believe it. Is Jeremiah agreeing with the word of Hananiah? No, not at all. And it's very clear in what he says next. Jeremiah is simply showing, oh man, I would love that to happen. Oh, that would be good. Oh, to see the yoke of the Babylonians broken and, and for us just to be submitted to God instead, for all these things to return back, oh, I would want nothing more. But Jeremiah says in verse 7, nevertheless, <laughs> basically nevertheless, it's not the way it's going down. It's not the way that God has drawn it up, you see. And so he says this in the prophets who have been before me, before you of old, in verse 8, um, prophesied against many countries and great kingdoms. As for the prophet who prophesies of peace, verse 9 again, when the word of the prophet comes to pass, the prophet will be known as one whom the Lord has truly sent. So he's basically saying, the prophet will be shown to be truly of God when that word comes to pass. And, and you've looked at many prophets down the road who have prophesied against many kingdoms and nations, and, and their word has, has come to pass. Many prophets in the past that didn't, weren't listened to, yet their word came to pass, simply show that they were truly of God. And again now for Hananiah, you got a great word there. I would love that to happen, but it's not going to come to pass. And in so doing, it's going to show you to be, Hananiah, a false prophet. The prophet will be known as one whom the Lord has truly sent when his word comes to pass. Well, Hananiah, <laughs> here's that and he's thinking, man, I, oh, I don't know, I better... I better rev up my message a little bit. I better amp this up here a little bit. Let's get a little bit more dramatic, see if I can win some people over. So in verse 10, notice what we see. Then Hananiah the prophet took the yoke off the prophet Jeremiah's neck and broke it. And Hananiah spoke in the presence of all the people, saying, Thus says the Lord, even so I will break the yoke of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, from the neck of all nations within the space of two full years. And the prophet Jeremiah went his way. So Jeremiah, or sorry, Hananiah now kind of, gives one of his own illustrated sermons, basically. Takes the yoke off Jeremiah's neck, and he just smashes it on the ground and says, that's it. That's the word of the Lord. That's what's going to happen to the yoke of, uh, of Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. It got, God's going to break it. And we're no longer going to be having to be submitted to the Babylonians. They're going to be defeated, and we're going to have all these things return. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. That's the word of the Lord. This is what Hananiah is saying. And he just gets dramatic here about it, right? And he gets kind of flashy, you know? And what does Jeremiah do? He just walks away. All right? The end of verse 11, Jeremiah went his way. He didn't feel the need to sit there and, and, and defend or refute the word. He didn't have to try to one-up Hananiah. He knew that his word and the word of the Lord would speak for itself. He could have gotten an argument, a little bit of a debate. He could have tried to do something even more dramatic, like, you know, tear Hananiah's clothes and say, this is what needs to be done. You need to rend your hearts, you know. And there's Hananiah standing there naked, like, whoa, man, that's awkward. That's really went up in me on that one. But Jeremiah doesn't feel the need to do anything like that, you see. He's just simply faithfully teaching the word of the Lord and knowing that the Lord, in his timing, will bring about these things to pass. He walks away. In the same way, guys, there might be times where you can see some people, you know, trying to be very flashy, trying to be very dramatic, trying to put on a real show in getting the word of the Lord out. And what the Lord says, I, you don't need to be flashy. You don't need to be dramatic. You just need to simply teach the truth of God's word. Many people think that we need to be entertainers. We need to be putting on a show. We need to be doing all these great things. And to all that, we just need to simply walk away from that and say, you know what? The word of the Lord speak for itself here. Jeremiah walks away. But he's going to let the Lord speak now in his timing and according to his way. Now notice verse 12. Now the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah after Hananiah the prophet had broken the yoke from the neck of the prophet Jeremiah is saying. So Jeremiah's 
now called, go and speak to Hananiah at this particular time. Go and tell Hananiah, verse 13, saying, thus says the Lord, you have broken the yokes of wood, but you have made in their place yokes of iron. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, I have put a yoke of iron on the neck of all these nations that they may serve Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and they shall serve him. I have given him the beast of the field also. Then the prophet Jeremiah said to Hananiah, the prophet, Hear now, Hananiah, the Lord has not sent you, but you make this people trust in a lie. Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I will cast you from the face of the earth. This year you shall die, because you have taught rebellion against the Lord. So Hananiah the prophet died the same year in the seventh month. Wow. Here's Jeremiah, here's Hananiah. You know, he's seeking to kind of take off the yokes, make things seem more palpable, give a good, easy message. Oh, we don't need this. No way. We're taking this off. We're smashing this down. Yet, what does Jeremiah say? You've removed the yokes of wood to strap yourself with yokes of iron. You've taken something that God intended for you, removed it, and given yourself something even more burdensome and heavy, something that you can't carry, something that you can't hold on to, and it's going to cost your life, you see. It's exactly what happened here. It cost him his life. In two months' time, Hananiah was taken out of the picture now. He was killed. Many believe that this is happening even right in a time of one of their, their feast days again where, again, many people are coming in and seeing now Hananiah killed, dead, and being reminded of the word that he spoke and the word that Jeremiah spoke, a, a prophet is known by the word that comes to pass. And here's now Hananiah taken out of the way, taken out of the picture and shown to be a, a false prophet, God taking care of all these things, and ultimately taking care of Jeremiah here. But it's a sad situation. We're going to just close with this. It's a sad situation when many people look to truly free themselves from not wearing any yoke. A lot of people in the world today are going, man, I don't want to submit to anything. I'm my own boss, you know. I'm not going to serve anything or anyone, you see. I'm not going to wear any yoke. But you see, too often what happens is they keep themselves from the one yoke that's going to be easy and light and freeing to only strap themselves with a heavier, more burdensome, and more restricted yoke. You see, everybody's going to carry a yoke of some sort, aren't they? Everybody's going to carry a yoke of some sort. The key is not, you know, being free from any master, the key is finding the right master. I mean, this is why, you know, Jesus says um, in, in Matthew 11, verse 28 to 30, Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls. I love this, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Too often people see, no way, I don't want that. I want to do things my way. And when they do it their way, they're only saddling themselves with a heavier, more encumbersome yoke that's going to weigh them down and trip them up. Whereas if they could only see that what Jesus has intended for them is an easy and light way. A way that doesn't bring you down, but lifts you up and brings life, satisfaction, and joy, and peace. A.W. Tozer says, the man who surrenders to Christ exchanges a cruel slave driver for a kind and gentle master whose yoke is easy and whose burden is light. That's the case. So, for Hananiah, who thought he had a great message, had it all together, the the yoke is on him, isn't it? And uh, he's wearing some egg on his face now after this, more so some yoke on his face. That's the case here. And so, yeah, those are some groaners to end with. But um, the lesson for us is very clear, isn't it? You know, let us be those that are hearing, listening, and responding to the word of the Lord. No matter how heavy, harsh, strong, weird it might seem, as we've seen here tonight, the Lord's way is always the right way, the best way, the way that's going to lead 
to an easy and light yoke around us. That's going to be a joy to carry. As we're doing things his way, we're doing things for him. We're doing things in him and with him, you see, when we're on that, on that yoke that he gives us. I think the picture, you know, when they would have two yokes, right, that you've got these two oxen together and they're carrying the yoke. I think when we take his yoke, it's as though the Lord's saying, I've got this on me. And you just come under that yoke and I'm the one that's carrying all the weight. You just need to abide with me, stay with me. And it's going to be an easy journey. That's the path that the Lord has for us. And Jeremiah is seeking to communicate that. Nobody's listening, and they're going to pay the price for us. May we listen to what the word of the Lord has for us and say, this is the path that's going to be the path of blessing. All right? Let's pray. Well, Lord, we come before you here tonight, and we thank you for... Again, this word, as we always do, because your word is so good, your word is faithful, and it, and it does speak to us, Lord. And um, I just pray right now for those that are here tonight that maybe have been feeling like they've been carrying a heavy load. Maybe they've gotten away from taking on your yoke and walking and abiding with you where you really carry the weight for us, Lord, and we just have to follow Lord, if there are those today that have been carrying a heavy burden, I pray that they would find the blessing of giving that over to you and submitting to you, Lord. There's blessing that comes when we submit to you, and that's kind of been the the theme here tonight, to submit to the word of the Lord, and I pray that you would help us to do that, Jesus, to submit to all that you have for us. Lord, let us not fear that, because that word submit can be such a, a harsh and heavy word to some. They feel that if they submit, it's going to mean that life is going to get real hard and challenging and tough. But yet, we find that when we submit to you, that's when life is a real joy and ease and blessing. So may we do that, Lord. May we take upon that yoke that you have for us. It's easy and light. And we thank you for that. Thank you for the life that you have for us, God. I pray that we would just serve you faithfully. Like Jeremiah, that we'd be faithful under fire. Taking in your word and giving it out as well. We ask this all in your name, Jesus. Amen.